My name is Mark McGuinness, and this is the 21st Century Creative, the podcast that helps you thrive as a creative professional amid the demands, the distractions, and the opportunities of the 21st century. Welcome to the second episode of Season 2, and this week we're doing something a little different. One aspect of the show I've received a lot of praise for has been the part that has nothing to do with me, and that's the music and sound production. All of that has been created by Javier Whaler and his team at Breaking Waves Sound Agency. And this week I have an interview with Javier about his journey as a musician and composer, from growing up in Venezuela to performing to sell out crowds all over the world as the drummer with the band Stereophonics, and also his current work as a solo musician and composer. We did something very different for the format of this week's interview, which was Javier's idea, and it was up to him to pull it off technically, which I'm pleased to say he did. So for now, let's just say it sounds quite different to all the other interviews you've heard on this show. Thank you to all of you who've written to say you're glad to see the return of the show. It's really great to hear so many of you have stayed with us since season one. Last week's interview with Tina Roth Eisenberg has got us off to a great start. It sounds like Tina has inspired you and given you plenty of food for thought. (laughs) And the other message I've been receiving from those of you who listened to season one last year is, what took you so long? Um, yes, it has been a while. And the gap between season one and season two has been longer than I intended. So here's what's been going on behind the scenes. Firstly, I discovered podcasting is a lot of work. I naively thought when I started that compared to blogging and writing books, it would free up my writing time and I'd be able to simply record a few interviews in the afternoons and breeze through the seasons like that. And, you know, I guess I could have done a a kind of cheap and cheerful show that way, but I really wanted to do something that was more professional and more valuable to you. And it turns out that recording a good interview takes a lot of thought and preparation beforehand, as well as some judicious editing afterwards. And I put a lot of thought into curating the right mix of guests for a season, as well as writing and recording my own sections. So that meant that the podcast itself took a lot longer to produce than I'd bargained for. But the main reason for the delay is the fact that I have other things to do. I'm writing two poetry books a collection of my own poetry and a long translation of Geoffrey Chaucer's masterpiece, Troilus and Cressida. Plus, I had a lot of work to do on my website, rebuilding and rejigging it after several years of neglect. And, of course, I have my coaching clients to serve every week on top of my own creative projects. And, you know, this is all stuff I can't delegate. I do delegate what I can, and I did have a lot of help from the developer from the site, but a lot of what I needed to do was editorial decisions about all the content I've created over, I don't know, the last decade or so of of blogging and writing on the site. And obviously writing poems and interviewing guests and coaching clients has to be done by me. It's an issue I'm seeing quite a bit with clients at the moment because it's great when you have a lot of ideas and a lot of projects on the go but sometimes you have to sit down and have a long hard think about your priorities and work out an order for your projects so that they don't get in each other's way but the good news is the log jam is now released and i am absolutely loving creating this podcast so I've decided I'm going to be doing this for a long time, so rest assured there is a lot more to come from the 21st Century Creative. In fact, I've already recorded several interviews for Season 3, so I am getting faster as time goes by. I'm aiming to release two seasons of the show in 2018, so make sure you're subscribed in iTunes 
And do let me know if there are any questions or issues that you would like me to address on the show. You can always reach me via the contact form at 21stCenturyCreative.fm. Today's theme is play the game you want to play. So you've probably heard the good news that the game has changed for creatives in the 21st century. Instead of kowtowing to gatekeepers like editors, publishers, record labels, movie studios, and so on, creators are now free to publish and promote their work themselves. The academics call this disintermediation, which basically means cutting out the middleman. If you listen to some of the keenest evangelists for this brave new world, only fools and fuddy-duddies would sign a book or a record contract these days or apply for representation by galleries or agents when they could sell direct to their audience online. Why jump through all those hoops and pay all those fees if you can do it all yourself and pocket all the cash? But what if you know for a fact that the people you want to reach still look to the gatekeepers as guarantors of quality. People who spend a lot of money on art tend to spend it with galleries, private collectors and auction houses rather than Etsy or artist websites. Readers of literary novels are often wary of self-published books. And believe it or not, there are still people who watch television on actual televisions. Or what if you're a little sceptical of the fact that self-publishing and going direct often seem to involve going via Amazon, Google, Facebook or Apple? The academics call this re-intermediation, meaning the replacement of one set of gatekeepers with another set. Or what if you've always dreamed of being signed by your favourite record label or book publisher or having your own TV show or directing a Hollywood movie? Should you give up on your dream? and turn to Amazon, Facebook, and YouTube instead? Not if you ask me. I think you should play whatever game you want to play. Just make sure you're clear about why you're playing it. If you really want to sign a book deal, or wait in line for a part in a movie, or hassle your agent to get you on TV, or network with the right people to get your art shown in the right galleries, then go for it. As long as you're aware that you are paying for the opportunity by relinquishing some control and maybe some money, and you're happy with the trade-off, then why not? Just make sure you get a good lawyer to read that contract first. And if you want to do it yourself by starting your own blog or podcast or self-publishing your novel or putting your album out on Bandcamp, then go for that. If you're in this camp, you probably don't care what the New York Times critics or the folks nibbling canapes at the private view think of your work, you probably relish the money and control more than their approval. Just remember that no creator is an island, and don't complain if Amazon or Google or Facebook or whoever change the rules overnight and make a dent in your plans. Or maybe you're a hybrid creator, looking to mix and match the best of both worlds. You use the traditional channels when they work for you, and the direct approach when they don't. So maybe you work with a gallery when you want to exhibit your art in public and reach a certain type of collector. But you also have a website where other buyers can find you, or where you sell prints or a different type of work to your gallery pieces. Or maybe you work with a publisher to produce a book that requires lavish illustrations and beautiful printing and binding. But when it comes to a shorter collection of essays, You'd rather publish it quickly and easily yourself. Maybe you work on film and TV projects for studios and networks when they come along. And at the same time, you have your own podcast or your own YouTube channel that you work on in your own time, attracting your own audience and creating a kind of show that would probably never get aired on the big networks. To me, the exciting thing about the 21st century isn't the idea that all the old media and gatekeepers and business models have vanished overnight and been replaced by shiny new digital alternatives. It's the fact that, as creators, we now have many more choices about how we make our work and how we get it out into the world. So play the game you want to play, whatever anyone else says. And remember, They're all games, so don't forget to enjoy yourself while you're at it.
One of the themes I keep returning to in this podcast is the idea that the times we're living in are a two-edged sword. On the one hand, we're living in an age of unprecedented creative stimulation via the internet, social media, accelerating technology, and an always-on working culture. And on the other hand, we're living in an age of unprecedented distraction from focused creative work, from all the same sources. And the biggest concern for many creatives is a nagging sense that their most important work is being left undone. If you're excited by the opportunities of the creative age, but worried about the effect of all those digital distractions on your creativity, then I've written a book for you. Productivity for Creative People. It's a short, practical guide to getting creative work done in the 21st century, based on my own experience as a writer, creative entrepreneur, and father. All the ideas in the book have been road-tested in my coaching practice with creative professionals like you. So, if you want to create extraordinary work without necessarily disappearing to a cabin in the woods, or even giving up your smartphone. Check out Productivity for Creative People at 21stCenturyCreative.fm slash productivity. That's 21stCenturyCreative.fm slash productivity. Javier Huela is a musician, composer, and music designer. Born in Argentina and raised in Venezuela, where he achieved national fame with the band Claro Oscuro before moving to the UK in 2000. Javier will need no introduction for fans of the band's stereophonics. He was the band's drummer for eight years, recording albums, touring the globe, and playing to packed stadiums, including the Live 8 concert in Hyde Park, that was broadcast worldwide in 2005. These days, Javier records his own albums, as well as playing drums with the likes of Phil Manzanera of Roxy Music and Zach Starkey. He also produces other artists, composes soundtracks for feature films and documentaries, and creates music for brands including Uniqlo, the BBC, ITV and Hasbro. As a listener to the 21st Century Creative, you're already familiar with Javier's work. He composed and recorded all the music and sound effects for this podcast, and his production agency, Breaking Waves, produces every episode of the show. I first met Javier when he asked for my help as a coach, and during the time I worked with him, I discovered he has a very meticulous and imaginative approach to creating music. He said to me one day, that when he composes the soundtrack for a film, he wants the music to be like an extra character in the movie. When I heard him say that, I knew I wanted him to create the music for the 21st century creative. I wanted the show to have a very distinctive sound, and I knew there would be a lot of media professionals listening, so I wanted the highest possible production quality. Judging from the enthusiastic feedback I've received about the music and sound production, I think I made a good choice. For this interview, we did something very different, which was Javier's idea. We met up in Hammersmith in London and walked along the bank of the River Thames while he told me about his journey from growing up in Venezuela and achieving success with Claro Oscuro to moving to London, playing with stereophonics and his current work as a composer and producer. Along the way, he shares his thoughts on what it takes to succeed as a musician and how the music business has changed radically in the time he's been involved with it. As we walk along the river, you can hear birds singing, passers-by talking, planes flying overhead, and traffic coming and going. Javier wanted to capture the soundscape and to give us a glimpse of what it's like to live in his world, where he is acutely aware of the sounds around him and the feelings they evoke. When I listened back to this interview, it reminded me of some of his work for films, where the sounds in the background have a subtle but important effect on the people in the foreground. To experience the effect for yourself, I hope you'll join Javier and I on a walk along the river and a journey into sound.
I'm walking along the riverbank in London, just past Hammersmith Bridge with Javier. Correct. And this is Javier's idea. He's, he wanted to meet and record outside. So Javier, wh why are we here? Why? Okay. Well, the whole reason why I wanted to do it here is because of the soundscapes. Mm -hmm. And obviously we're going to be talking about a lot of sound. Yeah. And uh, for me, it's quite important to perhaps not have a very controlled uh, environment, but perhaps have something which is quite real. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're walking along a, a path, a walk path that is along the Rim of Thames on the south of um, Hammersmith. And uh, it's a great place to not only listen to nature sounds, but also, as you heard, that uh, plane just passed by to Heathrow, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because normally I, would, I, I make strenuous efforts to record under very controlled conditions and get rid of any kind of random extraneous noise, but yeah. I feel, I, and I wouldn't do this with anyone else but you, but I feel <laughs> I'm in good hands. So. Well, hopefully, we'll see at the end of the, <laughs> at the, end of the interview and see if people can, can actually understand it. But no, the whole, whole idea is uh, to actually be immersed in an environment which is not only real, but it gives you a sort of a vivid representation of what we're doing now, which is a conversation, walking along, and perhaps not being in a, a sterile environment or controlled environment. And here we have a lot of sounds coming in and out that makes it real, you know what I mean? It makes right. it an experience. So that's what I wanted to do, basically. So I'm curious, Javier, what's it like to be you walk, going for a walk like this? Because I'm guessing you're going to be much, much more aware of all the sounds than I am. I'm, I'll maybe lost in my own thoughts or at best looking at the the beautiful sights around us but i'm probably not going to pay all that much attention to the sound unless you know, maybe i can hear the nice birds singing stuff yeah. like that comes through to me but what's this like for you well i think i think it's like any other senses that we have perhaps i'm more inclined to be uh, acute when it comes to to sounds because mm -hmm. it's something that i've been not only uh, prone to to do or like or as in my career, but also you kind of uh, develop it the more you fine tune it, if that makes any sense, with time. Okay. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, unfortunately, it's, it's one of those things that there's a part of you that doesn't really want to learn because you still want to be that kid discovering things and be excited about things. But also, if you know too much about technicalities and things like that, then you start like really fine tuning into a lot of things. Right, right. But, um, but yeah, as you said, it's, it's absolutely right. If you if you really try to isolate only the hearing as one of the senses and just concentrate on that, you, you're probably going to start hearing a lot of more things that normally you wouldn't do because you're right. so, also using the senses and other things at the same time. Okay, so I mean, what are you aware of as we're walking down this path? Well, our, our steps, for sure. Mm -hmm. I can hear a little bit of the river, the birds, but there's also a plane. Uh, I can hear a faint sort of sound of the motorway. Yeah. That it almost sounds like a okay, right. wind. I, yeah, I hear it now, you pointed it out. Yeah. Yeah. But also you can hear now the, the wind rustling in, the, in mm -hmm. the in the leaves of the trees. I can also hear the conversations of people passing by, or the cycles, or the steps from other people. But all of that, some of them are natural soundscapes, like what we're hearing from the, the wind. Mm -hmm. But then all the ones are man-made. And that's, I think, the, the, the beauty of it, that we, we're... Wherever you are in the world, doesn't matter in what environment you are, you're going to be having natural soundscapes and also man-made soundscapes. But in an essence, all of those together makes or builds up your own soundscape. And uh, when it comes to do sound or music or work against film, a lot of things get re recreated. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of things which are just there. They're natural. Hence why the whole reason of going along this path to actually experience some, something is just capture that something, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You don't have to like recreate this experience because it's happening as we speak and we walk. And I know the word soundscape is quite significant for you and your work. Could you talk a bit more about what you mean by that? I mean, I'm sure we have an impressionistic idea, but what's a scout soundscape for you? Well, I think per perhaps we have to start from what makes a sound. And, uh, and I think we have perhaps like three elements. I mean, we have what we know as speech or dialogue or, or someone speaking or singing. So that's one element that, that we uh -huh. consider a sound. But then you have what music is, which is you have a arranged a sequence of tones in a particular order that creates music. Mm -hmm. But then you also have the third tier, which is 
these that we're talking about, which is the soundscapes. Some of them are man-made, some of them are natural. So all of, all of those three elements combined is what makes sound, sound mm -hmm. piece. Some of them completely change over and over, and they're never the same because it could be the soundscape of a city and it keeps evolving and keeps changing, there's more construction, et cetera, et cetera. Other ones are more controlled, which you do that for a particular film or you do it just for a piece of music. Mm -hmm. So all this, these three elements is what makes a sound. And obviously, depending on the type of project or, or the piece, one of those elements could be more important than the other ones. Perhaps you just do a piece that is only music or perhaps you do a music that is only soundscapes and nothing else. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very open, it's an open book. You really can do anything you want. But already with those three types of sound, you've, you've got three points of orientation, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. And it's like you can bring one in and fade one out or...? It's very important, I think, perhaps, is to, to go to the core of things in terms of if you're using sound to communicate something, yeah. is really, really important to perhaps define what you're really trying to say and communicate. Therefore, whatever you create after that, you do with that same ethos and you will have a line of communication that will be clear. Yeah. Uh, because if it is just a narration, then you really concentrate on the performance of that person, the voiceover, what they're saying. And, uh, and hopefully, yeah, we're going to hear that <laughs> helicopter in the back. Mm. But there you go. That's why I wanted to have this random walk. Um, so, yeah, as I said, all depends really on what you really want to communicate because you will find that words on themselves, they can be such a powerful element if they're really well written yeah. and they're really well delivered and performed. Mm -hmm. It can really touch people and connect with people. The same thing can happen with music. And sometimes even with soundscapes can really happen. Let's say, for instance, if you're, I don't know, on a trip, on a holiday or something like that, in a space that you're normally not involved, and then you're sitting down just having, I don't know, a tea or, or a drink and just watching the sea or watching the mountains, and you really are, at that moment in time, you actually are taking time off from a lot of things that distract you yeah. to really listen. And that becomes quite powerful as well. Mm -hmm. So sound is almost, can be like a break from the everyday, like what we're focused on in our minds. Inevitably, I mean, sound is everywhere. That's, that's an issue as well sometimes, because we are overcrowded with sound. Yeah. And from the moment we wake up to the moment we, we go to bed again, even when we're sleeping, we're surrounded by sound. Mm -hmm. we, can, we couldn't actually be comfortable in a... In a chamber with doesn't have any sound yeah it will be natural for us we need yeah. that disruption we need that change in rhythm we mm -hmm. need that constant evolving of things coming in and out our, our brain constantly is processing all of that so we couldn't live without it um, i think it's more the fact of how do we actually relate to the use of that sense if that makes any sense mm -hmm. because unfortunately i think as us as human beings we we tend to uh, underestimate the, the power we have as, as human beings, really, mm -hmm. with all the senses that we have. We don't really fully explore what we can digest from the world in front of us every day. Sometimes we, we get so caught up in the, in the rat race or, or, or things that we have to do that we don't actually listen. And there's a lot of things in front of us that are there. It's for us to... Mm to read them is for us to take them. Hence why we sometimes go on a holiday and yeah. then you're actually going with such open senses, you know you're not yeah. working, and you take everything in. Yeah. And then someone comes to, I don't know, the city where you live, and they have the same experience, but you don't see it. And then you go and like, oh, yeah, hold on a second. Yeah, I mean, he's right. This, this person is actually hearing all these things or seeing all these things that I wasn't even paying attention. And a few minutes ago, you talked about when you, you walk through a sound state like this and you're listening to all the sounds, it's like being that kid again. Yeah. Who gets excited by this. What age do you remember first getting interested in sound and in this way? I think from the day I was, I have recollection of memory, to be honest, mm -hmm. one way or another. Because, I mean, 
Yes, I mean, my professional career probably developed much later, but I vividly remember my dad playing guitar when I was a toddler. Mm -hmm. And back in the day, we, because we moved from Argentina to Venezuela in the 70s, yeah. instead of sometimes writing letters, or most of the time actually, instead of writing letters to my grandparents, we used to do cassette tapes. Yeah. So we used to have a cassette tape machine where we record with a stereo little table mic uh -huh. and my dad used to play guitar or he would just put the microphone in front of us and we would say stuff to our grandparents mm -hmm. and put that on the post and send it to them right. and that's the way we sort of wrote letters between ah, okay between us all the time and uh, I remember that really vividly and it was always there and sometimes I would see my dad playing a guitar and a friend would come in and play guitar as well and we would listen to records together so, so yeah, it's always been there one way or another. Mm -hmm. The physical act of actually capturing something with a microphone and also an instrument or records. So it was just a part of family life? Yeah, even though it wasn't perhaps... Uh, I mean, my dad didn't do it professionally, but clearly he had a, an inclination towards it because yeah. he played guitar in the 60s uh, as a teenager, did a few recordings, a few albums and, and such. So he clearly had that passion. My, my godfather was a guitar player as well, so it's, it's always been there, even though nobody did it perhaps professionally as I end up kind of pursuing, but yeah, but yeah the, the passion, I suppose, was there. And at what age did you discover the drums? Uh, 13. <laughs> I started <laughs> playing when I was 13. Yeah. And the whole reason why I started was because my brother got an electric guitar from a second hand shop and yeah. then he kind of encouraged me and said why don't you do something else and maybe play some drums so we can jam together mm -hmm. so the next trip we did to Argentina uh, I met with my dad's um, drummer from the 60s and he said well if you want to have a spare pieces from a drum kit and I give you that so he gave me like like three or four pieces from a drum kit it wasn't like incomplete drum kit but uh -huh. That's what I took back to Venezuela. And with that, I started sort of jamming and playing along. And, uh, it, and it was like, you couldn't actually play properly. It was impossible because it's like some, so many pieces missing. Uh -huh. But I instantly fell in love with it. It's like my brother and I, we started jamming. But instantly I went to, I, I asked my mom, I, I want to do classes. I want to do lessons. And, uh, and after that, I didn't look back. I was spending three, four or five hours a day just like drumming. For me, it was a, a sense of, not only the connection I had with the instrument and the physicality of it, I quite liked, but for me it was a, a great escape. It was a, a place that I could go, that I could really be myself. Uh -huh. And I mean, growing up in Venezuela was amazing for a lot of reasons, but culturally a lot of things perhaps I wasn't that uh, inclined to be part of or I didn't feel that represented. For some reason I was kind of hiding there in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas every time I went back to Argentina, I will feel more, more at ease with a yeah. lot of things happening culturally, the type of music they will listen or, or the type of activities or the type of sports. So yeah, for me, it was, um, it was a big escape in that sense. And so how did you learn? Well, I started um, doing some drum lessons first in, a, let's say, like a kid's um, class. Uh -huh. It was like 12 or 15 of us. Yeah. And, uh, after a month, the, the drummer asked for my mom to come in and she said, look, your kid, he's, he has rhythm. So if you really want him to like um, progress, he will benefit much more from doing like one-to-one -one lessons. Uh -huh. And then my mom asked you, is that what you want to do? I said, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, so basically I, I was there for a, a month and a half, two months, and then end up doing private lessons with this teacher. But it was so funny because it wasn't like, in the middle of Caracas downtown, in mm -hmm. a in an area that is actually not necessarily that nice, right. and basically he had on the ground parking garage. He had some storage units, mm -hmm. and in one of the storage units, he used to have like two drum kits or three drum kits put together with different brands, and that's where he gave his classes. So yeah, you will play. I, I will be going there every week. Thirteen years old, going down on that place, fumes from the cars and everything, and playing every every week. But it was an amazing experience. I owe everything I have to him. Um, what was his name? Jose Matos. 
Uh, he's a bit like uh, Jose Mato is like a bit of a legend in Venezuela. He, uh -huh. he came from more classical uh, training, mm -hmm. uh, but he has taught absolutely everyone that has done, let's say, well in, as a drummer from Venezuela. And uh, it was an amazing experience. I mean, to be honest, I, I, it was only, I think it was three, three of us or four that we were quite young. Yeah. Everyone else was like well more mature. They had bands going on and everything. I mean, we were like the the kids, like the new kids on the block, just going there and jamming and and with all the really amazing musicians that will pop in and out all the time. It must have been a great feeling knowing that the bar's this high. Yes, absolutely. You know, and you've got to step up. Absolutely, yeah. it was a, 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 an amazing challenge. But also, he was very fierce in the sense of like doing things properly. But at the same time, he will encourage you. I mean, he will actually put you to play against all the guy that has been doing classes for eight years. Mm -hmm. And he will go like, well, look at him. He's only 13. He's doing it great. And <laughs> I was like, yeah. And, and you kind of start discovering the whole, also the whole love for your instrument as well. Yeah. Because it's not only just doing the drum lessons and that's it. I remember I did at least two months worth of just snare which is the main wow. sort of uh, drum that you have between your legs. And, yeah. and it's probably the most musical out of the whole of the drum kit. But I, my idea was like, oh, I just want to start playing straight mm -hmm. away. And I couldn't. Right. But I was lucky in that sense because, because I had a partial drum kit. I couldn't anyway. Right. So I couldn't actually go home and do whatever I wanted. Right. I didn't have right. a choice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you had to focus on that. I right. had to focus on that. And it was a, a blessing in disguise, you know, in, the, in that sense. And yeah, you, you start falling in love with your instrument because you start discovering not only that you're, let's say, hitting something to produce sound, but how you hit it, uh, the different techniques. Then you start understanding the instrument, what it's made of, what's the depth, how you tune it. And then you start, I mean, in my case, I was always obsessed. Like, I wanted to do my own drums one day and, and obsess about how cymbals are made and everything because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's that thing, isn't it? With, with musical instruments in general, especially, well, now has changed a bit because it's quite a lot in the box and in the laptop, but when you actually play a physical instrument, I mean, there's that... But it doesn't get much more physical than the drums, No, no, yeah. not at all. It's an amazing therapy. It's, it's, it's definitely been my meditation. Is that what makes it special? I mean, because I know you play other instruments, but drums are your real yeah. passion. What, why, what is so special about the drums? Um, I think for me, it's uh, the ability to be in a place and really live in the present. That's something oh, yeah. that I became aware of with, with time. Yeah. Because when I'm playing drums, you get to a point that you already learn, let's say, the part that you're playing to a level that you're not thinking about it anymore. You actually are just performing. You're actually interpreting what you're, what you're doing and, and what you're playing. Because you could, you could play the, beat, the same beat with five different drummers and they will all sound different. Mm -hmm. And that's something you, well, discover with, with time, I suppose. But for me, it's, it's been that, being, being able to be in the present and being able to be engaged with what's going on. I mean, it's there and then. What your body is actually hitting or physically producing, that is the present. I mean, with other instruments, I think you get to that place as well. But I don't know, with drumming, it's like you're using your four limbs. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing else you can do, unless yeah. you start hitting something with the head. I say. <laughs> but I mean, you're physically using... You've never done that? To, no, I try, but it didn't <laughs> succeed. Um, it's like you, you're using literally your two legs and your two arms. Yeah. So it is a very... Uh, I mean, a doctrine that you're really connected with everything else that you're using, if that makes any sense. It's almost like a, a type of sport, in a way. Yeah. I think with time you start looking at it that way, like you have to do your exercise to keep, in, keep your level, your strength and your technique, and et cetera. And you only get better and better, really. Mm. It also struck me watching you play with a band, it was almost like you're, you're the guy connecting it all together. You know, you're, you're reaching out to all the different... Yeah, it happens a lot. I mean, I think... Um, the drummer is a, is a instrumental part of any any band yeah. or any any project. I think that's why the rhythm section is so important. You know, when you when you have a, a drummer and a bass player yeah. really locked in, yeah. everything else has a space to breathe, come in and out, and etc. Mm -hmm. But the moment you drop off, it's like everything goes <laughs> upside down. Exactly. So okay. so yeah, it's, it's absolutely crucial to have a good drummer. I mean. 
film, film and scenario is like, I mean, your band is as good as, as your drummer is. Right. And, no uh, pressure. Exactly, <laughs> exactly no pressure. <laughs> and it's, it's very true. I mean, I think it's, it's really important to have a drummer that can not only keep a beat, but also feel the momentum of the band and, and yeah. kind of almost drive everything or keep everything together. Okay, so coming back to your story, you know, you, you had this great experience of learning under your mentor or your teacher in this quite pressured environment. You had some really dedicated practice, sometimes accidental, because that was all the only part of the instrument that you had. Yeah. At what point did you have a band yourself? By 15, I was already playing professionally. So it, it happened quite quickly, to be honest. I, I kind of started picking up the instrument. I liked it. I was playing to records all the time, play with my brother and, and our neighbor. But then they kind of lost interest and I wanted to keep on going. Yeah. And, uh, and then there was, I heard there was a guy in my class at, at, uh, at school that played guitar. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, I said to him, look, why don't we get together and, and play? So yeah, we started doing the typical thing that any kid does, you know what I mean? Like get together and start playing and jamming mm -hmm. the songs that you, you like and, and you have a preference in common. And, and that's how we started. And, and instantly, one of my best friends, there was a, a, a guy that came from the US, that was studying the US, and he had a Stratocaster, and I was like, wow, yeah, he does. And he liked exactly the same kind of groups I liked. Uh -huh. So I hook up with him as well, and my other friend, but it was so obvious that it was just this new person and me that we just wanted to do something yeah. original. Mm -hmm. I mean, original material, and we just wanted to do things together. I mean, it was an instant fit. Uh, and that was Carlos, that was the, the singer and, and, and guitar player from Carrascuro. So as soon as I, play, I started playing with him, and we, we, we kind of played with different people until yeah. probably a year after we, we had a, a permanent lineup and we just, Miguel, Carlos and myself. And by, yeah, 1992 and so on, we, we started playing professionally, yeah. So this was Carrascuro? Yeah, that was, yeah, my first band in Venezuela. I was 15. And I was playing like really dodgy places at night yeah. with my brother's idea. Yeah, so Did I could get in. <laughs> yeah, actually, you know what? My 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 parents they they've been fully supportive. Yeah. I mean they, I mean poor them. I mean we used to rehearse in my house all the time. I mean my mom and dad were separated by then, but but my mom bless her. I mean she just put up with any any kind wow. of noise, That's any people coming in and out in the house, and yeah, it was a great environment in that sense. I mean, not necessarily she understood what I did, but... Mm -hmm. but, <laughs> but she supported you. Yeah, too. fully. And yeah. I think that's crucial, to have someone that really gives you the, the, the platform or at least the environment for you to feel free to do what you want to do is, is crucial. Yeah. By 1992 is really when I started playing professionally. And uh, it, was, um, it was an amazing experience because I used to play at night with my brother Sadi and then go, go to bed late and then next morning I had to go to school. Right. <laughs> Rock star by night, school boy by day. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Okay. But it was amazing. I mean, the Clara School years was absolutely amazing. Uh, to this point, I think it's one of the best years I did as a, as a musician mm -hmm. from the point of view of being in a gang, being in a band, doing something yeah. together, because we did everything so independently. We, we like, pressed our own uh, covers of the cassette tapes that we used to do and we like duplicate them ourselves uh, did the pressing of the t-shirts design our own flyers uh -huh. every gig we did um, like a conceptual uh, show so uh -huh. so we be became known for being a band of like okay what are they going to do next and for us it was quite obvious thing to do because the thing is in Venezuela there wasn't that many places to play anyway Right. so if you want lots of people to come every month, you have to change a little bit of uh, right. the, the... You have to reinvent yourself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and we had to, for us, it was the obvious thing to do. So, so people got used to the fact of uh, every month we will play and they will go like, OK, let's see what these guys are going to do again, even though the songs were kind of the same. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe we can hear some Clara Scura. Yeah, we yeah. could. Why not? Just 
So, how long were you in the band then? Well, Claroscuro, we... It was about nine to ten years. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it was all the way from there until I left in 2000. So, so yeah, it was nine years and a half or so. Yeah. And did it become your full-time gig or were you mixing in with other things? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. I mean, South America is very different when it comes to people that do arts or, or people that do a creative or want to develop a creative career. Um, unfortunately, there's no such a platform for people to, to do full time. So uh -huh. you always end up doing something else. Right. And uh, even though I never stopped, I did went to uni after that to study uh, media and film. And it was kind of the closest career I could find to what I wanted to do. I mean, I could have gone to a conservatoire or, or something like that, but I, I just didn't do it. I just, for some reason, I just wanted to do something more visual as well. And um, so you always end up not only having a job and perhaps studying, but at the same time having a band where you do gigs. Yeah. So you end up doing like two or three or four things. I mean, uh, Latin American people, we were quite well known or, to, to be all-rounders. Right. Of many, many things at the same time. And that's kind of accepted. It's, it's the way it is. Right, because, I mean, we'll get on to what you're doing these days. You do, you do a really wide range of stuff these days. Yes. Yeah. So maybe that was more of an advantage than, you know, if, if you'd just been full-time doing Claro Scuro, then maybe you wouldn't have the breadth of skills and experience to draw on. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's, it's, it's been a blessing, absolutely, because it has allowed me to, to develop on, uh, different projects or work with different kind of people mm -hmm. that I wouldn't otherwise. Right. And so when did you come to London? I came to London in 2000. And uh, I came specifically to study um, sound engineering and music production. Yeah. So in my plan, it was like, OK, well, I'm going to come here, do that for a full on year, uh, pay all my studies and everything and invested on it. Um, but then life changed and then I, I stayed. I mean, I came with my girlfriend at the time and we were thinking about perhaps going to Spain together. Mm -hmm. But obviously, as, as it always happens, that relationship didn't, didn't flourish mm -hmm. when we were here. So six months after, my life, my life completely changed and, and I started concentrating on my studies and really make use of the time and the technology and all the things I had here. Because some of the, let's say, the, the console, the recording consoles I was learning to use, they don't even have those in Venezuela. So for me, it was such an opportunity to be right, here. Right. And I, I had to make the most of it. There's no way I can't, uh, I can't use all of this. So you say it all changed when you came to London. What, what changed? I think I was very naive. Uh, and I'm always very naive in a lot of things, I think, in my life, which is a good thing. Um, but I was naive in the sense of thinking that, OK, I just do it for this period, that's it, and then I go somewhere else. It's like, it's like, like John Lennon says, you know, when life is all the accidents that happen yeah. in between that yeah. you're planning your life. And, yeah. and it's exactly that. And, and six months after, I, I, I find myself on my own, but really listening to the city, really learning from it. Uh -huh. And then I was like, wow, I need, I need more time. And, right. uh, well, I've been here <laughs> 17 years. <laughs> <laughs> Have you had enough yet? <laughs> no, no, that's the thing. And so the next band after Cloud Oscuro was Stereophonic. Yeah. How, how did that come about? Well, that's it, it, gradually, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, when I came here, did my studies in sound engineering, I, I was lucky enough to connect with some people that allowed me to start working with them. Yeah. And uh, one of those persons just got a studio that they need to do a lot of production on. And they call me in, because I used to help them quite a lot doing the, the lectures and the things that they yeah. need to do. And uh, 
they got the place, but they had some pending recordings already with certain clients. Mm -hmm. So I took over those, those uh, sessions just as an assistant engineer, just looking after the equipment, make, make everything yeah. connected, et cetera, et cetera. And my first session there was uh, with Pretenders, and oh, really? they did like a, a mix of a live album. Yeah. Uh, fortunately enough, it was only with the engineer, so it was quite calm and so on. <laughs> okay. But then the second one I did, it was with Seraphonics, and then uh, we, they basically were writing what became the fourth record, you gotta go there to come back. And, um, and yeah, we just like, hit it off, became friends, kept in touch. And I went on tour to record or assist recording the, the engineer that was recording all the live shows. Yeah. And uh, one, one thing led to another. And by the time they came back to the, the fifth record, writing wise, they didn't have a drummer anymore. So I got, got involved playing on the demos. Mm -hmm. And then after that, they invited me to record with them on the actual studio. So I took time off from my work to go right. to with them. <laughs> you uh, made that a priority. Yeah, and live, and, and live like a, in Oasis for like a week, and then yeah. go back to reality. Yeah. Uh, but then they, they invite me to different, different meetings and so on, and I rec remember vividly when we finished recording the whole album, yeah. we were mixing in, in Notting Hill, in what it used to be Sarm, Sarm West, which is not there anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and they sat down and put like the, the schedule, like the whole year planning in advance. And they asked me, oh, what do you think of it? I said, well, it looks amazing. Good luck, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but the guy said, no, 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 what do you think? Because we wanted you to, to join the band. And, and I was like, whoa, okay. <laughs> I mean, how did that feel? Amazing, amazing. I think I had really intense experiences yeah. happening in, in, since I, I've been in, on my own in, in the UK. Yeah. Uh, I remember vividly the first one that was a major breakthrough. It was when I got like my first sort of work permit and yeah. I could like just do the career that I wanted to do for the first time ever as an yeah. engineer. So that was amazing. Uh, and then the second Maxi one, it was when things happened with the phonics as well, because it was, okay, this is happening, it's a reality. All these things that I've been craving or I've been wanting to, to have or be as a, as a musician, as a kid, yeah. they're there, they're in front of me. It's actually crystallizing now. And don't get me wrong, I mean, with Claro Scuro, I had that. Yeah. But as I said before, I mean, the, the, the market is much smaller. Yeah. So you could reach let's say, the, the, the ceiling quite quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's just a matter of to s stick around and keep reinventing yourself and, and creatively push yourself to do something. But also with that comes all the commercial aspect of it, which is, yeah. okay, you want to you wanna do this because you want to be in a band that tours bigly or in the world or take your right. music everywhere in the world. Right. And that's what happened when I joined the Phonics. That's exactly what we started uh, having. And so, I mean, lots of us dream of being in a big band and touring yeah. the world and recording in plush studios and so on. How did the reality compare for you with the dream? Very, very close to it, to be honest. I think for some reason it's happened in my life, in a time in my life that I could really absorb it properly yeah. and embrace it. Yeah. Which. If I'm honest, if that happened to me perhaps when I was 15 or 17, it wouldn't have been the same yeah. at all, whatsoever. And I think the fact that it did happen that way, it was tremendous. Because it allowed me to really absorb it for what it was. Yeah. It's, like, it's almost like remembering why you started making music in the first place. Yeah. When I, I, I remember like shivering with like, excitement and, and, and shaking when, when I heard one of my songs from Clara School in the first time on, on radio. Yeah. And that moment, or just like jumping up and down on your bed, listening to that, or, or, or seeing the posters of those artists that you always admire, yeah. having that is really what connects you to music. In my case, it was. So all the other stuff that comes afterwards, which is, I don't know, some people thrive upon fame and or the money or the success and this and that. For me, it was, it was that. And, and literally being able to connect with that every, every time, is, it was crucial. Yeah. And, you know, I'm thinking of the kid, the teenager with the snare drum. Yeah. Hour after hour. You know, if he hadn't done all of that work, there's no way you would have been in a position to... Absolutely. ...to take the opportunity. Yeah, you wouldn't be prepared. It's, um, let's say, like a... 
an Olympic athlete. They yeah. train so hard for this goal to yeah. reach. And, but if they, they don't actually gradually get to that point, they're never going to be able to perform yeah. to that level. Yeah. And it's very similar in that sense. I mean, you have to be prepared, not only technically, but also mentally, because there's a lot of challenges. I mean, there's things that you're living in life that you've never been experienced before. And you're not quite sure how you're going to react to those things. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so many things are so much fun, but other things as well, you have to be careful. Because, uh, I mean, touring is a completely different world. And I think if your mind is in the right place, you're going to have an amazing time. Yeah. But if you, if you, if you don't have a... If your head is not in a good place, you, you could go down in a, on a spiral very quickly. Mm -hmm. So what did you find most challenging about it? Not much. <laughs> <laughs> I think, no, I think, I think challenging, it was uh, the degree of commitment in terms of um, the dedication to it. Yeah. Because I think a lot of people tend to... Um, be misinformed in, in, in the amount of work that is involved. I mean, uh, you see an artist in a, in a stage and you see it, okay, you see them for an hour and a half, two hours, two and a half hours, and I mean, you're like, oh, I want to have that life. Yeah. But then there's a lot of things that comes into place. Like, for instance, you, you could be doing 15 interviews before that gig, and also you have to do sound check, and you just arrived on the morning from a different country. Yeah. So, so physically as well, it's very important to be on, on the top of your game. Yeah. Because otherwise you don't cope. I mean, you start, uh, you, you, you start relapsing, you know what I mean? It's, like it's quite difficult to keep on going otherwise. The, the amount of work that is involved all around that for that show to happen is, right, is right. incredible. And, and obviously you have the separation from friends and family. It's, it's quite hard yeah. as well because you could be away for a longer period of time. I mean, now it's easier, I would suppose, because things can be organized in chunks of time. So you don't have to like go away like in the old days and come back two years after, you know what I mean? Yeah. But, but I think it's still, it's still uh, challenging, but with technology, you can actually be in touch with more people easier, if that makes any sense. Okay. And you played with the band for what, eight years? Yeah, Something it's like just that? over eight years, yeah. And you did quite a few albums. Yes. You toured, you played things like Live 8. Yeah. When you look back now, what are, you, what are you most satisfied with about what you did with the band? I think everything in general. I think every, every album was very different from another one in uh -huh. terms of the experience, of, because you were playing different songs and, and some albums were more successful than others. Uh -huh. uh, but the whole experience of being in a band is... I, I would recommend it to anybody from the point of view of, of being a team player mm -hmm. and being able to, to have that sort of push and pull uh, experience, you know what I mean? Where you're not on your own, you know what yeah. I mean? There's all the people that can, can push you, all the people that can pull you or vice versa, you can help them as well. And that's a beautiful thing. It's almost like trying to be a kid that has never been able to grow, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because uh, you're still playing. I yeah. mean, there's, there's an element, if you, if you take it too seriously, I think you start losing a bit of the, exactly. of the, of the magic and the charm of what you're doing it for. Yeah. At least that's how I see it. Um, I mean, there's people that make a career of just being a business, but, but for me, you, you have to have fun. And, okay, so you say you recommend the experience, you recommend being in a band, so if somebody's listening to this and saying, okay, sold, I want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> what advice do you have? Because it's presumably, ah. you know, isn't, as we've seen, it's not an easy thing. And, yeah. and has the world, the music business changed so much since you started out that, or would, would that kind of path still be available, do you think? It has. It has changed dramatically. Um, having said that, I mean, there's ways to still achieve that, I think. But I think going back to basics, I think the most important thing it would be not really to think of all the things that could become or what do you want to achieve, etc., etc. Because a lot of people and all the new generations, we're, we all tend to be biased by what the objectives should be and, and the outcomes and what yeah. do you want to achieve or you want to be recognizable and fame or this and that. And in reality, that's, that's not the way or the reason why you should start in the first place. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, if I recommend someone to do it, I would say, you know what, just get other people that kind of know how to play an instrument and just go and do a jam. 
jam yeah. together in a rehearsal space. And that's it. You don't have to do anything else. Just play tunes that you both know. But really, it's, it's more about that dependency on the other and relying upon that other person to play. Yeah. That's what makes it beautiful. Because, for instance, if I'm the drummer and start playing a beat, and then the bass player starts playing, but he, I drop, then everything disappears. Yeah. So that activity gives you a, a great insight of what is to be doing something with other people at the same time live, living the moment, yeah. that you can't really recreate. You have to do that and then. I mean, it has changed a lot because now technology has moved so forward that a lot of people don't even know the, the craft of playing an instrument anymore. Uh, and that's not so positive. Yeah. But at the same time, you can't be so purist about it. The reality is that the technology is there to stay. And that's something that I discovered working with new talent. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why I do it quite a lot now, because you start understanding how their brain works, how they envision or comprehend or, or digest music, mm -hmm. and how they create it. So it's a very different way of doing it. Yeah. And, and it's as valid as the other way, as long as they're being original, as long as really, as long as they're actually expressing themselves, mm -hmm. which is ultimately probably the, the most important objective of making music. So since Stereophonics, you've done, you make your own music, you play with other people's bands, I know you produce, you do uh, soundtracks, for movies and documentaries. I mean, talk us through a little bit of the range of stuff that you do these days and, and maybe how they relate to each other. Yeah, I think everything happens for a reason. <laughs> right. Because there's a reason why I came to study sound yeah. in the first place. Uh, there was a part of me that, even though I was content with my instrument, I could see really the potential of knowing about how to achieve certain things. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, there's people that are extremely successful and amazing at just being perfect at what they do in that particular task. Yeah. And they're really amazing drummers or bass players, or et cetera. But for me, I, I like to imprint a vision to things. So it's very important to be able to communicate. Mm -hmm. And in order to communicate, you need how to express yourself. You, know, you need to know how to do it. So that was the main reason why I came here in the first place. I started sort of buying some equipment back home in Venezuela. And I was like looking around and say, why am I doing this? I have to go somewhere where I can learn how to do this properly. Yeah. And in a place where I can actually be challenged for real, be in a place that this is a career. Mm. And that's why one of the reasons why I decided to come here. And once you know how the tools work, then it's like when you start reaching that point where you can know how to express yourself. And also perhaps being a drummer as well, it's like it tends to be quite percussive led and it is perceived as just percussion and that's it and you don't know how to write songs. Right. So there's a big challenge on that, that in, in, in one sense it's like really gives you a keep I kick up the ass, I say, I have to do that, you know, yeah. I have to show people I can do it. Show, stick up for the drummers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, it's, it's, uh, the more you start playing other instruments, you start realizing how things work. For instance, yeah. when I started, I picked up a guitar for the first time, it was when I brought my dad's guitar from the 60s that was in the storage of, well, it was in the garage yeah. of my grandmother's house. And it was his first ever guitar, and that was my, my first ever guitar, which I... Um, <laughs> we've just been walking this path and all of a sudden there's a river. So now we, river we've, run out, we we've can run out of footpath. The, the, the river's <laughs> flooded on the path ahead we'll of us. We'll probably have so to go back and turn around. I think, yeah, I'm not, I don't fancy <laughs> swimming across to the other side, so... OK, well, this is really recording out in the, exactly. in the wild. And um, basically, when I started playing guitar, I realized that my drumming was changing. Yeah. Because knowing another instrument affected the way I, I will express myself with that other instrument yeah. as well. Because you start understanding the, the relationship between all of them. Yeah. That's that's when you start like seeing all, all the things come together, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. I mean being in just a band is, is great, it's amazing, amazing experience, really fun. But there's all the things that are out there as well that you could be using sound for, that is, or for you to like experience them and put them together. 
tell me a bit about your work with films, because actually this was the kind of strand of your work that made me think, ah, ah, I want to work with this guy. So t tell me your approach to, say, creating the soundtrack for a, a movie. Well, for me, <clears throat> music and sound has always been quite visual. I don't know how to explain it, but it's, it's something that I always uh, think music has a color. Right. And, and I see it almost like a palette as well. You can't, yeah. It's a, about balancing that white canvas and, and try to put different colors on it. Well, music is exactly the same. It's like you can't just have one thing unless yeah. you're doing it like completely on purpose. But uh, always being quite a visual person and the fact that I sort of study film as well, it made me have that in the back of my mind all the time. And uh, I've always been a big fan of films anyway. Mm -hmm. And the, their score, the music score, and the sound and everything. And the fact that I did all my career as a musician, but then having studied that, it's like there came a point in my life where, where you start, I don't know, things start converging again and aligning themselves to, to get this new flow of things happening. And, and for me, it was crucial to start doing music and sound for films. Uh -huh. Because it's almost like anything that you can create on your soundscape, on the music, has the potential to be... Um... <laughs> we'll see about the noise on this one. <laughs> has the potential to become an intrinsic part of that piece, to yeah. the point that music can become a character in a movie. Right, right. So I see it that way, and, and it's... The way I, I try to do projects now or create things is to try to visualize how sound can be used uh, as, as a form of expression. Right. And use it correctly to really try to um, reach an objective along with that director of that piece, etc., etc. So this really jumped out at me when you first told me this idea that having the music as an extra character in the film. Yeah. And it just made me realize, you know, in some really, you know, my favorite films, the, the soundtrack adds so much to the atmosphere. It almost is, you know, like another presence. Yeah. And I was thinking about this podcast at that point. And I knew that the music had to be good because I know there's a lot of professional musicians will listen to it. And I knew that it had to sound good. But it was only when you said, oh, the music could be like another character, I thought, that's what I want. Yeah. <laughs> it would be, wouldn't it be cool if we could have a soundscape for the podcast that is, you know, that's why I went to you and I said, look, I, I want a theme tune at the beginning. Yeah. And this, this is what I like. You know, th this is my sense of, of how I'd like it. But I'd also like to have lots of incidental atmospheric music. Yeah. I think I said to you, make it like Blade Runner. Or, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, that's, I mean, you, I th you delivered in spades on that. I mean, it's one of the things people keep saying, how different the podcast sounds and, and how great it is having all the different musical dimensions to it. down to the river here? Yeah, let's try it. <laughs> OK. I don't know if we can, but we'll try. <laughs> so this is 21st century creative safari today. <laughs> At least we're going to get less uh, trucks. OK, so, you know, we've covered a lot of ground here. Well, the two of us have covered a lot of ground. <laughs> we've done a lot of walking. But, I mean, we've, we've talked about your journey from Argentina, Venezuela to London, all the way around the world. Uh, Drumming, rock music, uh, soundtracks, famous podcasts. <laughs> uh, what do you focus on these days? Projects. I don't, I don't know, it's very, very, <laughs> very ambiguous to say so. But I think uh, now lately I've been involved with such a, a big sort of uh, array of different types of projects. I mean, I've been lately writing and composing with a lot of young artists. Mm -hmm. And I've been finding that experience very rewarding because I've been able to, let's say, pass on a lot of the experience I have gained throughout the years uh -huh. uh, and help them get to a place that perhaps they couldn't, uh, at least on this point, get to that place. And I think it's such a rewarding thing to do. Um, 
songwriting and composing and, and, and production of, of new artists, I, I've been finding that quite successful. It has to be the, t the right fit as well, because yeah. it's not like you just put a title producer and just go on and produce people. It's not what I want to do anyway. Um, for me, really, what it is now is about sort of reinventing yourself in your career, because I have all this influence from the moving image and visuals with the sound and the music. And it's quite difficult to perhaps be encapsulated in only one thing that will fit everything. And what I realize is that really, in an essence, what I'm doing is I'm designing music. That's what I've been right. doing for a long time. And, and, and with that responsibility of design comes thinking about it, getting to the core of the things, putting those foundations together, build it so it's strong enough to be there on its own. And I'm not a big fan of just being one thing. And, uh, and that was clearly uh, what happened to me as soon as I wasn't involved in the stereophonics anymore. I started all these different things starting to happen. It's almost like uh, your pores are completely open. Yeah. And one of the first things that happened was a movie. Then also I did a, a work campaign for Uniqlo. And the whole experience was absolutely different. It's like I was yeah. able to sit down there and there with the director. She was explaining to me exactly what she wanted to do in terms of the, 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 the motion and what they wanted to communicate. And we did a whole brainstorming there and then when they were shooting the, the, the commercial. Mm -hmm. And that allowed me to, to go and revisit all of that at my studio and then put a proposal through and do a whole music campaign mm -hmm. and sound campaign and, and end up being played on, on their stores as well, the music. Whereas that period of the Christmas campaign, so and you know that track is completely different to a lot of your other stuff. It's yeah. more kind of poppy and electronic yeah. and, and dancey. I mean, we'll stick it up in the show notes, and we'll put we'll put some videos and we'll put some music and sound in the show notes for this episode. Obviously, so you know you can go and get a sense of the richness of what Javier is doing. But you know that for me that was another example of like if I'd heard that and I'd heard some of your other stuff I wouldn't necessarily have known it was the same guy I think yes it's a good point actually I think a lot of people tend to um, think of a musician and think okay this is the only thing that this person does mm. and that's it and they, they're completely in that box yeah. and I will hate to be in that box right. because what I know I can do is I can actually do things and do them well that's my, that's my main care Mm -hmm. really caring about what you're trying to, to do and really understand it. And there's different levels or, or elements how you can really express yourself. I think there's a time and a place for things. Like, for instance, when I do a, a record that is my own solo record, that's a different story. That's yeah. me, just the artist, sitting down, making music and trying to communicate something. So it's, very, it's a completely different hat that you're wearing yeah. at that particular point. And I think that, that's something that has come with time and experience. And... When I'm doing a completely different project, let's say for a film, I really want to start working with the director from the sort of embryonic stage and sitting down. I want to read the scripts. I want to understand what they want to tell. Mm -hmm. Because for me, it's like, I don't want to be added on at the end of the project. I mean, I can do it, but it's not, it's not yeah. what I want to do. I want to be involved from the beginning. Right. Even though if that doesn't mean that we don't start working together, but at least you start munching away that vision of the director to yeah. really take you to the place that they want to do. I, I've been collaborating with a, um, a director in New York for quite some time now, and he's very, very specific of what he wants, and he's very unconventional as well, which for me is a, is a blessing to have someone like that. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first time that I worked with him, the first thing that he said is like, do whatever you want, but don't put piano on it. <laughs> and it's like, well, okay, and literally, Putting piano on soundtracks and scores is kind of the most obvious thing to yeah. do that a lot of yeah. people do. And for me, it was great. And that relation has evolved to, to a point that we did a, um, a short film called, uh, called the, the Book of Judith. Yeah. And the soundtrack of that, literally the music and all the soundscape became a character on that movie. And there was moments of that, that house that you could hear how it was creaking the wood because that, you literally yeah. can see it's an old house. Obviously, it has little windows with gaps on it so yeah. you, can, you can have a sense of that wind coming, kind of coming through, the, through the, the gaps and also you hear the, the wood and also I mean you play obviously emotionally with it where, where there's a point that gets more intense and then the creaking gets bigger but there's clearly a, a let's say an element of, of uh, 
character or personality of that setting as definitely, well. Definitely, definitely. Is that movie online? Can we link to that? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if it is. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> it would be great if we could link to it, because it's a really great illustration of what yeah, you're saying def about... Yeah, definitely the trailer. I think it's because it was still doing a lot of um, uh, festivals. If we can get the trailer, well, at least see if we can link to the trailer, because that, I mean, when I watched that, I really thought, okay, right, this, this is what he means about the extra character. Yeah. And there's, I mean, there's other projects as well. There's, there's another film I did, which, which is a short film called uh, Writer's Block. Mm -hmm. And I kind of took upon the liberty of proposing how I wanted to do the music. And they just like went with it. And basically I decided to do music with just symbols. And the whole soundtrack that you hear music-wise is all done by symbols. There's nothing right. else. Right. And because it was me, a part of me trying to really explore the complexity of, of the instrument yeah. and all the different tones and overtones, etc. And having all the correct technical tools allowed me to create that. Mm. And uh, it was a lovely, interesting project as well. OK, I think it's time for the creative challenge. Wow. Yeah. So that's so this, that time of the year. <laughs> right, so this is the part of the show where we, uh, my guest sets a challenge to you, the listener, that is going to stretch in a new direction creatively and, and maybe as a person. So, Javier, what, what challenge would you like to set the listeners? Well, I've been thinking this for, for a long time and I didn't really want to get very technical with it because yeah. I think uh, sound is there to be enjoyed for everyone mm -hmm. and it really is there. So it's all, all for grabs, basically, like anything else. And uh, what I thought is, why don't the listeners take the time and commit to five minutes every day for a week, right? Mm -hmm. So what they have to do is choose a setting of their environment where they live. Could be different times of the day, doesn't matter. But really commit to closing your eyes, sitting in that place for five minutes and just listen. And start listening to all the things surrounding you, all different sounds coming in and out. And then after those five minutes, write everything down, all the things that you could hear. Ah, okay. So every day you do that for seven days. Right. And then at the end of that week, just read all that. Mm -hmm. And you will have what your soundscape is. It could be natural or man-made elements, doesn't matter. Right, right. But it's I love about it. the process of perhaps just like sinking in into where you live and really listening. And this is, I mean, you can do this anywhere. Don't, you don't need any technology for it. It's actually yeah. the only things that you need is just your pair of ears and just go for it. Javier, thank you. This has been quite the journey. And, uh, <laughs> Literally. <laughs> well, it has for us. And also, you know, as, as, the, as we said, you know, following your journey. So where can people find you and follow the next chapter? The best thing to, to contact me is uh, on my own webpage, mm -hmm. www.javierwhaler.com. Yeah. And also, I have my own sound lab agency, which is my sound agency called Breaking Waves, and it's www.breakingwavesagency.com. And obviously, we'll link to those in the uh, in the show notes. And the usual, obviously, social media things and stuff like that. <laughs> okay, so we'll put we'll put your YouTube, your Twitter, your Instagram up on the show notes. So, do I mean Javier uploads? videos and images of him playing with famous people and uh, some really nice uh, demo tracks that he records and uploads. So lots of interesting stuff mixed in with, with the films and all the other goodness. So we'll, we'll put all of that in the show notes. And once again, Javier, thanks so much. Thank you so much for, for having me. It's been a great experience. You have been listening to The 21st Century Creative, hosted by me, Mark McGuinness. You can find the notes for today's show with more information about my guest and links to the sites we mentioned, as well as all the archived episodes at 21stcenturycreative.fm. If you enjoyed the show, then I hope you'll subscribe in iTunes, and I'm always grateful for your reviews, and also for sharing the show with your friends and followers. If you'd like to have the 21st Century Creative Foundation course delivered to you for free, giving you 26 lessons of advice and worksheets on carving out an original creative career, 
you can sign up at 21stCenturyCreative.fm slash free course. And if you are an experienced creative interested in getting my help as a private coaching client, you can learn about how I help my clients at 21stCenturyCreative.fm slash coaching. Thank you for listening. I hope you'll join me again soon.